Uh, hello, my name is Professor Pierre Lambiazzi. I'm a consultant cardiologist here at Bath Heart Centre in London. And I've been using the subcutaneous ICD now for almost a decade, actually. Um, looking started really with patients with cardiomyopathies, particularly hypertrophic cardiomyopathies. So it was regarded really very much as a niche device for unusual patients. And over time, we've seen it really expand into the general ICD population. And it's a real um, pleasure to be able to present this Praetorian trial has come from Reinhold Knops at AMC uh, and his group and for us have been able to contribute to this trial. I, I think this is really a landmark study which is going to establish a subcutaneous ICD in line with transvenous devices in terms of regarded as a device to seriously consider for usual practice. The problem until now has been we've constantly had to compare the subcutaneous ICD with transvenous devices using retrospective data or propensity match studies. And this is, trial is fundamental because it's allowed us to directly compare the two devices. These are my conflicts of interest. This is actually a landmark study which will really um, provide a strong foundation in providing reliable data in comparing transvenous and subcutaneous ICD directly. As up until now, we've had to rely on historic data multivariate analyses in order to um, make equivalent comparisons. You can see here that this is a multi-centre study conducted between the US and Europe, led by Reinhold Knotts from the Amsterdam Medical Centre. And there are a number of British contributors to this study. Transvenous ICD has proven to be an effective therapy in preventing sudden cardiac death for a number of years now. Um, but there are issues with intracardiac leads, as you well know. First of all, those related to lead insertion itself, such as pneumothorax or cardiac perforation, the risk of long-term infection and endocarditis, particularly with in device changes, and potentially lead dysfunction related to fracture or insulation breaks, which increase with time. And indeed, in some types of lead, this can be as high as 20% after six years of follow-up. So the SISD was really designed to avoid these lead-related complications and it is now a class 2A recommendation in those patients who do not have a primary pacing indication for bradycardia or CRT or those with recurrent monomorphic VT requiring anti-tachycardia pacing. And these recommendations are based on observational studies, but until this Praetorian trial, there have been no randomized controlled trials comparing transvenous with subcutaneous ICDs. So the primary objectives for this study were to compare subcutaneous versus transvenous ICD treatment for the major adverse events, including inappropriate shocks and acute and chronic complications. It's also designed to evaluate if the lack of ATP function leads to more appropriate shocks for the subcutaneous ICD. The important things about this study are that it was an investigator-led study from the Amsterdam Medical Center and therefore was not directly uncontrolled by Boston Scientific, the manufacturer of the subcutaneous ICD. There was a one-to-one -one randomization between SICD and transvenous ICD. ICDs from all manufacturers were allowed and the patients had to have a class 1 or 2A indication for ICD therapy. All patients had to be eligible um, for a subcutaneous ICD before they were enrolled and then were explain that there was equipoise between the two devices and they would be randomized accordingly. This composite endpoint of ICD complications and inappropriate shocks was utilized in this study. This slide gives an overview of the numbers that were recruited. As you can see, 426 patients were recruited in the SICD arm, 423 in the transvenous arm. The inclusion criteria were patients had to be over 18 years of age and had an ICD indication for primary or secondary prevention according to the European and United States guidelines. Exclusion criteria were the standard criteria for subcutaneous ICD, i.e. a clear indication for pacing therapy, whether bradycardia or CRT, and patients who could potentially benefit from ATP if they were known to have VT at less than equal to 170 beats per minute or VT that was refractory with recurrent monomorphic VT that couldn't be managed with medication or ablation. Patients who failed SICD vector screening could not be randomized into the trial and any patient with a prior ICD also could not be um, randomized. So these had to be patients who for the first time received an ICD.
Overall, 849 patients um, were recruited into the trial between March 2011 and January 2017. This involved 39 centres in Europe and the United States. And transvenous ICD choice was at the discretion of the implanter. It could be a sing single or a dual chamber device, and the manufacturer was also the choice of the implanter. Standardised programming was utilised, which I'll explain in a moment, and local clinical practice was utilised for implantation technique, defibrillation testing and hospital discharge. Each patient had to visit the hospital once in the first four months um, post-implant, and subsequent follow-up was standardised for at least every six months and outpatient clinic visits at least annually. The study was designed such that it was a non-inferiority trial with a threshold of a hazard ratio of 1.45. The assumptions were based on the fact that 425 patients had to be recruited into each arm to allow an expected transvenous ICD inappropriate shock and complication rate of 17.2% for 48 months. A superiority analysis was allowed if um, non-inferiority was established, and also there was a pre subgroup analyses which were allowed for age, sex, and BMI. You can see from this table that programming was standardised. Obviously, there will be subtle variations in the fast VT tone depending on the manufacturer, but essentially a fast VT tone of more than 182 beats per minute for the transvenous ICD was utilised, allowing one round um, of ATP. Um, therapy had to be delayed for 10 seconds in the transvenous ICD. VS zone was set at more than 250 beats per minute for transvenous ICDs. For the subcutaneous ICD, programming was set with a conditional zone of more than 180 beats per minute to allow SVT discrimination, and an unconditional um, zone set at 250 beats per minute as the VS zone. So every effort was made to try and make the programming as equivalent as possible in terms of these zones of therapy. Pacing was set up at VVI 40 um, for the transvenous ICD. This is a breakdown of the types of devices which were implanted. As you can see here, 87% of the devices were single chamber transvenous ICDs versus 12% for dual chamber devices. The transvenous ICD manufacturer was evenly spread um, amongst the different device groups and different generations of the subcutaneous ICD were, were utilized. And it's important to note here that only a small proportion, proportion of patients received the latest generation device which allowed the utilization of the smart pass filter. Programming was adhered to in the majority of patients with 90% adhering to fast VT or conditional zone for subcutaneous ICD and 97% for um, VF versus in the transvenous ICD 84% and 86% respectively. This is a breakdown of the patients in terms of their recruitment and crossovers. As you can see here, there's a small proportion of patients actually cross over from subcutaneous to transvenous ICD, and a small number of patients weren't randomized into the trial for reasons of death or malignancy or patients um, withdrawing consent. You can see that overall, follow-up was completed in 75, at least 75% of the patients for the subcutaneous and transvenous ICD arms. The majority of failed follow-up was due to mortality in the follow-up phase. This is quite a complex slide, but it's just to highlight the demographics and the characteristics of the patients. Essentially, as you can see here, ischemic cardiomyopathy accounted for essentially 70% of the patients for the subcutaneous and transvenous ICD arms, and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy for the remaining third, with a small proportion of patients um, being made up of um, other forms of cardiomyopathy or idiopathic VF. Secondary prevention was only utilised in 20% of the patients, the remaining were primary prevention patients. You can see here that a significant proportion of patients, 20, at least 25%, were diabetic. And this um, slide breaks down the procedure characteristics, which I'll highlight now with histograms. You can see overall the implanter experience along the x-axis was evenly spread between quite experienced subcutaneous ICD implanters in 41% of the SICD implants, with implants having more than 
70 cases under their belt before recruiting into the trial, but, and then the remainder being those within plants between 30 and 70 range or between 0 and 30. Obviously, there was much more experience with transvenous ICD implantation at 86% of implanters having more than 70 cases in their experience. Looking at the procedure characteristics, you can see here that there was actually an equivalent implant duration between the subcutaneous ICD in yellow and transvenous ICD in blue, taking about 55 minutes for implantation. And then looking at fluoroscopy, there was a minimal fluoroscopy time just to assess the SICD lead position, but for transvenous ICD, the mean and fluoroscopy time in seconds was 144 seconds. Turning now to the procedural characteristics, a two incision technique was used in the vast majority of the subcutaneous ICD implants, 70% of patients. Um, prophylactic antibiotics were standard of care. General anesthesia was required in 49% of the subcutaneous ICD patients, but only 3% of the transvenous ICD cases. And patients actually had a prolonged hospitalization equally in the transvenous and SICD arms at about 20%. Defibrillation testing was used in the vast majority of the SICD patients at 90% compared to 46% of, of transvenous ICDs. And the impedances um, during DFT testing were equivalent at 75 ohms between the two device types. DFTs were successful in 97% of subcutaneous ICD cases and 99.5% of transvenous ICD cases. So no difference between the two groups. So now turning to the main outcomes, as I said before, the primary composite endpoint in this study was that of combined inappropriate shocks and complications. And you can see here the overall primary endpoint was equal between the transvenous and subcutaneous ICDs. So there is non-inferiority for this primary composite endpoint. And this was consistent across all sensitivity analyses. Comparisons can also be made um, between device-related complications and inappropriate shocks. You can see here that the device-related complications were equivalent, and also inappropriate shock rates were equivalent between the two groups. So in the untouched trial, in the subcutaneous ICD patients who received the later generation devices and a smart pass filter enabled, the inappropriate shock rate um, was only 2.4%. This is really important because one of the problems with the subcutaneous ICD has been the risk of T-wave oversensing causing inappropriate therapies. And now with SmartPass technology being appropriately evaluated, this demonstrates that the inappropriate shock rates are at least as low as with transvenous ICDs. However, lead-related complications were much more common for the, for the transvenous ICD versus the subcutaneous ICD at 6.6% versus 1.4%, and this did reach statistical significance. Looking at the types of inappropriate episodes, you can see here that the transvenous ICD in blue had a higher proportion of inappropriate shocks for AF and SVT, but T-wave oversensing was significantly higher um, for the subcutaneous ICD versus the transvenous ICD. So cardiac oversensing predominantly due to T-wave oversensing. And this is, um, can be explained to a degree by the fact that the majority of the patients did not have a smart pass filter to allow T-wave oversensing to be excluded. Um, and we know from other studies, for example, the untouched study and also registry work from the Latitude database, that inappropriate shocks can be reduced to um, just over 4% with the smart pass filter in, in situ. So one would expect a lower T-wave oversensing event rate in this trial if this new technology had been available. Looking now at the primary endpoint for all the different subgroups of patients in terms of their age, NYHA class, diagnoses, there was really no difference um, according to subgroups in terms of equivalence. All-cause mortality was also equivalent between the two arms of the subcutaneous and transvenous ICD with an equal balance between cardiovascular deaths and non-cardiovascular deaths. Appropriate shock therapy was utilised in a higher proportion of patients 
for the subcutaneous ICD versus the transvenous ICD. And this could potentially be explained by the fact that ATP was not available for the subcutaneous ICD patients. And actually, 13% of patients received ATP in the trial, in the transvenous arm predominantly, as opposed to some patients that switched over from sub-Q to transvenous ICD. And these patients um, were shown to have that 50% of ATPs was successfully terminated the VT. So ATP was successfully terminated VT in 55% of treat treated episodes. So this would indicate that in a proportion of patients, about 6% would have benefited from successful termination of VT um, from the transvenous ICD function. Looking overall at complications such as major, major adverse events, hospitalization, there was no significant difference between the two groups and also no significant differences in crossovers to other types of therapy. You'll see here the six patients crossed over to a combination of either bradycardia pacing for a class 1 indication, ATP, or crossover to CRTD. So the main limitations of this trial are essentially that the physicians and patients and clinical event committee were not blinded to the therapy allocation. The device technology has evolved such that now we have the smart pass filter. Physician implant experience was higher for transvenous versus subcutaneous ICTs, which could also potentially be an issue for um, T-wave oversensing related to lead tunneling experience. Screening data are incomplete, so we cannot rule out if there's a selection bias to a particular gr um, group of patients who receive the subcutaneous ICD. The median follow-up was 48 months, which might be too short to identify lead complications of the subcutaneous ICD. Praetorian XL has now been extended in order to allow follow-up for a further 48 months, and the results are expected in 2024, so lead-related issues can be explored in more detail. So in conclusion, the subcutaneous ICD is non-inferior to transvenous ICD therapy with equivalent device-related complications and inappropriate shocks. This applies to both conventional primary and secondary prevention ICD patients. The results are consistent in subgroup and several sensitivity analyses. There are no differences in ICD complication rate in terms of the in and the instance is similar to previous studies. There are no differences in the inappropriate shock rate overall and there are less lead-related complications of the subcutaneous ICT, 1.4% versus 6.6%. The SICD should be considered in all patients who need an ICD without a pacing implication. Thank you for your attention.